culturais, filósofos, economistas, curadores de importantes museus e artistas visuais que trabalham em diversas cidades do mundo, tanto em projetos de grande impacto como em intervenções pontuais de grande significado. Há pelo menos quatro décadas, cidades marcantes como Glasgow, Barcelona, Paris, Bilbao, Liverpool ou Londres optaram por trilhar o caminho da regeneração urbana, tendo a cultura como elemento indutor. Resultados alcançados por essa estratégia mostraram-se desiguais. Em Londres, o projeto da Tate Modern se implantou de tal forma e com tal vigor que terminou por construir o London Cultural Quarter, somando as áreas do Bankside e do South Bank, num contínuo de articulações artísticas, sociais e econômicas às margens do rio Tamiza. Já em Bilbao, o Museu Guggenheim, embora um landmark da cidade para o mundo, talvez tenha contribuído mais para o turismo do que para a renovação da trama, da trama urbana local. Por que a mesma estratégia se revela tão diferente dependendo do lugar onde é empregada? Como projetos arquitetônicos podem atender às exigências dos grandes circuitos culturais e, ao mesmo tempo, articular o entorno da vizinhança onde se inserem? Até que ponto o urbanismo tático pode ser usado como compensação à falta crônica de investimentos no setor cultural? Essas serão algumas das questões levantadas nos debates de hoje. Lembro também que hoje, no final do dia, teremos o coquetel de lançamento do livro Diálogos da Economia Criativa entre Brasil e Reino Unido, uma série de publicações realizadas pelo British Council, com curadoria de Lydia Goldstein e contexto de autoria dos palestrantes Carlos Augusto Calil e Donald Hislop. Eu queria pedir, então, só para que desligassem os celulares ou deixassem no modo vibratório. Nós vamos ter uma dinâmica de uma apresentação seguida de um debate e perguntas poderão ser feitas pela audiência por escrito, entregues às assistentes que estarão colhendo as questões. Eu queria chamar a Lídia agora para dar umas palavras em nome da Menal. Lídia, por favor. Bom, bom dia a todos. Eu queria dar as boas-vindas uh, em nome uh, do presidente, do Lister Pins, em nome de toda a diretoria da Bienal e dos meus colegas que uh, foram fundamentais para que esse projeto fosse implementado hoje. Uh, e queria dizer do meu especial prazer em estar aqui. Uh, na verdade, uh, a ideia de fazer um seminário desse tipo, uh, com Arque Futuro, Uh, vem sendo questionada por várias pessoas. Bom, o que, que a Bienal tem que ver com isso? Qual é o papel da Bienal nessa história? E eu acho que, uh, eu não poderia deixar de dizer, que o Arco Futuro é uma das boas e raras iniciativas de diálogo que apareceram nos últimos anos aqui em São Paulo. Uh, um diálogo não entre pares, mas um diálogo entre as mais diferentes pessoas. Um diálogo que tenta sair uh, do fla-flu, do, do branco e preto, da uh, falta de olhar e de escuta que está se solidificando em vários debates nesse país. Eu acho que a ideia de ter um diálogo que ajude na transformação, que não seja um diálogo entre pares ou um diálogo acadêmico, é algo que uh, esta, sim, é uma grande herança maldita que nós tivemos de um período longo de ditadura militar e que até hoje se reflete nas relações entre as pessoas, entre os partidos, entre as organizações, e que tem impedido, muitas vezes, o Brasil de avançar em vários dos setores nos quais nós precisamos avançar de uma maneira urgente. Eu acho que a Bienal de São Paulo vem tentando, cada vez mais, trabalhar com a ideia de sair de um pequeno gueto de artistas, curadores e apreciadores de artes. Nós temos a imensa consciência de que o papel da cultura, como elemento gerador de novas ideias, como elemento de educação, como elemento de ajuda num processo de reflexão, é fundamental. E a ideia, portanto, é de que a Bienal cada vez mais abra suas portas, literalmente, como o projeto do Oren nos ajudou, mas também ampliando esse diálogo com a sociedade, e fazendo com que a Bienal, de fato, seja algo não só da cidade de São Paulo, mas seja algo do Brasil e que seja, portanto, parte de um processo uh, de melhoria, de qualidade de vida, de educação e de uh, formação de novas gerações. 
eu acho que hoje temos aqui uma oportunidade única, na medida em que se estabelece a possibilidade de criar condições para novos processos. Fico muito feliz e vamos ao que realmente importa, que é ouvir esse diálogo e essa possibilidade de novas reflexões. Muito obrigado por, pela presença de vocês. Obrigado, Lídia. Bom, é, nós, só para lembrar que nós temos tradução é, simultânea dos debates, quem quiser pode retirar os equipamentos. Só vamos pedir uma... Quem usar a tradução simultânea, que só acerte a regulagem do áudio, que muitas vezes fica muito alto e depois acaba incomodando as pessoas ao lado. Bom, nós vamos começar agora, nós vamos chamar para a primeira apresentação é, o Lucas Farais, é, que tem como tema central uma reflexão sobre os lugares da arte, espaços que nos circundam, afetam e definem. Lucas é formado em filosofia e estudos culturais. Fundou um centro interdisciplinar em Berlim, o Lucas Forais Studio, com foco na discussão de arquitetura, arte e cultura contemporânea na esfera urbana. Ele atua como editor e curador de diversas instituições internacionais e é membro do Conselho do AEDS Network Campus, plataforma de estudos da metrópole sediada em Berlim. Lucas, please come up. Good morning, Sao Paulo. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Thomas. Thank you to Arc Futuro. Thank you to the Sao Paulo Biennial for inviting me to talk here at this day at the debate about performing cities, art, architecture, and public space. My name is Lucas Feierreis. I'm from Berlin. I'm an independent curator, writer, and educator. And as Thomas said, I focus on the Yeah, the critical discussion and the interplay of, of the arts, of, of, of urban creative practices. It is also my honor to be the kickoff for today, kind of to break the ground or to topically bring us all into, into the subject matter um, under the, the first header, Creators of the Urban Scale. So I'll try to provide um, an overview that is both personal and general Uh, of the performative qualities of creative practices in the urban environment and kind of act as a starting point then for the further discussions during the course of the day. So um, as with all my work, um, theory and practice will intertwine and I will try to keep the threshold between the two, theory and practice, as, as low as, as possible. So. Let's start with the title, Performing Cities, or uh, The Performative City, or Performing the Urban, the title of my talk. What does the performative, or what does performance actually mean in the context uh, of the city? Well, a crucial notion, or crucial notions to a performative understanding of architecture on an urban scale um, means that the city unfolds in situations, actually, in utilizations, in co-actions, in co-creations. In short, performing cities or performing the urban is not so much about urbanity as an, as an object, but it's about conceiving the urban as a process, a process of performative quality. So, Performativity, or um, the performative, has been a, a key term in uh, the cultural studies for actually about 20 years. It's sometimes referred to also as the performative turn, turn and it has influenced a uh, theoretical debate for some time. And since a couple of years, it has also entered now the architectural and the urbanistic discourse. However, the term performative, and please excuse that I give like a general introduction to the whole thing. The term performative, however, originates not from theater theory, as one might imagine, but actually from linguistic philosophy. And with John Langshaw Austin, introduced the distinction between performance and the performative in his speech act theory. While performance solely delineates the execution of an operation, the performative, constitutes a situation in which articulation itself generates a new reality. 
Say, for example, I'm a priest or I'm a municipal official, and I declare the two of you as husband and wife, I create a new social reality. And this is the, the idea of the, of the performative. So it's not just about saying something, but rather to perform a certain kind of action. Performativity in this context, in this understanding, is so not purely linguistic, but it's rather a social phenomena. Now, the application of the performative to the urban discussion must be read against, again, um, the backdrop of a number of, let's say, four thinkers in the field, such as Michel Foucault or Henri Lefebvre. Foucault uh, um, already proclaimed um, this, this, uh, our time as the era of space, and Lefebvre embraced a multiplicity of spaces that are socially produced and made productive in social practices. So Lefebvre understands space not as a static or given, but a continuous production of spatial relations. He thereby also strongly focuses on the contradictory, conflictual, and ultimately political character of the processes of production and reproduction of space. But on a side note, and I think that's always relevant to see and to understand, um, these thoughts and ideas must always be understood within their specific historical context. In this case, it's the 1960s. So it's not only a time of political change and social upheaval, but also one that in many ways redefined our understanding of space. And I'm, I'm literally speaking, not only Lefebvre and the production of space, but it's also the student revolts in the streets of Paris and across Europe. It is also at the time of human space flight in zero gravity and actually man walking on the moon. So this is a completely different definition of space. And very novel spatial experiments in architecture that leave the confined boundaries of the discipline and actually situate themselves in, in great vicinity to artistic happenings and, and performances. But correlating to what Lefebvre calls l'espace vécu in his complex theory about space, the term lived space, describes the active process of perception and production at the very same time. Space emerges in a process of acting between individuals, in a process of utilization of objects, in a process of everyday life. In addition, there's also a discursive thread in architecture theory that underlines the performative virtue of architecture. This special performative virtue sets architecture actually apart from all other professions. We are constantly part of the aesthetic reality of architecture. Because with our own body, we are not part of the architectonic space that we, uh, we are part of the architectonic space, excuse me, that we produce and perceive at the same moment. In architecture, we are co-creators, participants, actually. That's quite different to the visual arts, where we are spectators. In architecture, we are co-actors, we are participants. It is always a complex architectural situation we find ourselves, in which we perceive architecture, and in which only then architecture emerges as such. Architecture, as Umberto Eco called it, the art of articulating space, is thereby gaining also a new relevance in urbanism. And yes, cities are dynamic place, uh, spaces of change in which space is constantly articulated, negotiated, and renegotiated. Far beyond the conventions of architecture and territorial planning, cities offer a multitude of opportunities for alternative engagement. Given norms, forms, and regulation within the cityscape are commonly subverted in actually performative resistance, I might call it. It is the ordinary users and inhabitants of the city, me and you, who constantly challenge and adapt civic spatial rules and functions to their own benefit. Another important forethinker thinker in this field, Michel de Soto, notes in 1980 in his practice of the everyday life, the act of walking is to the urban system what expressing oneself, the act of speaking, is to language or to formulated statements. The play of steps shape the space. I repeat, the play of steps shape the space. They weave the basic structure of places. In this sense, the movements of pedestrians create one of the physical systems that constitute the core of the city. 
but cannot be pinpointed to any particular place or located because they themselves create the space. So while walking through the city, we are not only experiencing these situations differently according to our individual point of view, but are also creating spaces through our play of strides. From, this has a historical uh, a long heritage, so to speak, from the detached and observant mode of spatial engagement of the flaneur wandering through the boulevards and arcades of the late 19th century and early 20th century. Think of Proust, think of Edgar Allan Poe, Edgar Allan Poe's Man in the Crowd, or think of Robert Mosil's Man Without Qualities, Walter Benjamin's Arcades Project, to the intoxicated rumbling and drifting through the city streets of the situa situationist Derive to the newly emerging figure of the traceur who fluidly adapts his or her movement to any given spatial restraint while moving to the city from A to B. I believe it is such practices of urban culture that we can learn the most about the performative quality of urban space. Be it the hit and run modus operandi of graffiti writers who are leaving nothing but traces of a different reading of the city that contest, provoke, and sometimes blend into the cityscape. Sao Paulo is a fantastic example for that. Or skateboarding that just like graffiti offers a completely alternative view or use of the city that tests the boundaries of the urban environment by threatening conventional definitions of space. Skaters actually radically subvert the intended use of the city and its buildings by using its structural elements in a way neither practiced nor understood by most normal civilians. In his theoretical and practical exploration of these urban practitioners, British architectural scholar Ian Borden argues that skateboarding applies an implicit yet ongoing tendency to critique contemporary cities for their meanings and modes of operation, one that challenged both the form and political mechanics of urban life. But similar approaches can be found amongst the whole generation of urban creatives today to whom the city is not only their natural habitat, but also their main field of operation. Their own unique countercultural form of engagement with the urban realm is distinguished by a principle of creative disobedience towards accepted, dominant, spatial, and social practices. They do not accept accept cities as they are, but create their own space, their own architecture, their own cities. Here, for example, Wermke Leinkov, a duo from Berlin, who became quite known for the white American flag on the Brooklyn Bridge that they installed uh, earlier this year. And these other works where you just see them kind of walking and, and being one little figure in the city skyline. Or more theatrical pieces, like Willy Donier in Bodies in Urban Space that act as a work that merges the human body within a diversified urban architectural environment. The intention here is clearly to point out the urban functional structure and to artistically uncover the restricted possibilities of movement and behavior as well as the rules and limitations of city space. Radio Ligna, another project which is called a Radio, uh, Radio Ballet, where uh, a random uh, crowd is kind of uh, directed via radio messages uh, on, a, on a, a pirate radio station that they listen to, and they're directed in enough public spaces to kind of lay on the ground or do certain dance moves. To Jordi Golomers, an architecton, uh, an emblematic film and photo series um, in the cities of Barcelona, Bucharest, Brasilia, and Osaka, who show a fictional character carrying cardboard models and replicas of real buildings. And to the changes of scale, he describes a sarcastic and kind of critical drift through these cities. Or Brad Downey's spontaneous sculptures here in Berlin, where he transformed a temporary bicycle lane and obviously confused the police quite a bit, we see on the right hand side. or the Depluto Collective's humorous 
thought-provoking, unsolicited messages in urban space here in St. Petersburg. The secret of happiness is... So these are a few out of many and of many and many, many more. But all of these ephemeral and anonymous artworks thereby suit the character and the rhythm of the modern metropolis that demands for constant rejuvenation and urban practice on a daily basis. By means of these urban innovations, interventions, we witness actually quite an interesting process. We witness an aestheticization of the city and a simultaneous urbanization of the arts. Or as once again, Lefebvre put it quite ingeniously, the art of living in the city as a work of art. In other words, the future of the art is not artistic, but urban. So this idea can also be traced in numerous architectural projects across the globe that play on the temporary nature of architecture. Performative architecture that is not built to last, but rather reacts to its urban environment. Call it performative urbanism, tactile urbanism, pop-up urbanism, informal and spontaneous urbanism, all names for the same idea and for the same approach. Here is the Space Buster by Raumlabor, basically pulls up in whichever corner and spontaneously creates a space. Obviously also strongly inspired by experimentations of the 1960s and 70s in architecture, just like Haus Rucker or Chor Pimmelblau. Or a project here in Brazil, Topographical Amnesias, an architectural intervention which transformed a previously underutilized quasi underground labyrinthine pillared hall with airs of a trash dump. So here architecture, landscaping, env and environmental uh, reclaiming intermingle and work as an urban set for a theater play. They are prime examples of a changing self-perception of architecture that looks beyond the boundaries of its own discipline. The ability to overcome the confines of the prevalent passive experience of urban surroundings and actively explore the hidden potentials also opens up the prospect of discovering a world of difference for permanent architectural interventions, such as an L architect's ingenious transformation of a non-place below a highway in the Netherlands into a thriving social hub. or the half a mile long urban space wedging to one of the most ethnically diverse and socially challenged neighborhoods in Denmark by Topotec One, Big and Superflex, which is conceived as a giant exhibition of urban best practice from 60 different nationalities of the people inhabiting the area around it. Such creative spatial practices within the urban realm at the intersection of art and architecture, I have widely discussed in a number of publications over the years. Interventions in both the build as well as, as well as the natural environment that range from small to large scale, ephemeral to permanent, playful to formal, and from individual to collective actions. All of these diverse projects are conjoined in their affirmative endeavor to transform abstract spaces to concrete places. This deliberate alternation and oscillation of the former to the later can be described very simply as a process in which a particular part of our spatial environment is being activated, inhabited, and cohabited with an added value of experience and meaning through performative actions. An exercise that allows for both an individual and intimate as well as a collective and shared appropriation of our environment in life on an aesthetic, functional, social, and political level. In this context, the words of Jane Jacobs, the Canadian writer and activist, best known for her seminal book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, still holds true for me in the discussion of public space and its societal implications. Cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. So following, vaguely following her line of thought, I have curated for two subsequent years a large festival on the main cultural axis of the city of Rotterdam that welcomes approximately 30,000 visitors in three days that open up the country's cultural season in early autumn. 
For the first time that I did it, under the title Victory of the Bottom Up, I invited Dutch and European artists to active, actively challenge the passive experience of the urban environment and actually find locations within the city center where they want to intervene. The diverse projects realized within these days mark the tactical victory of bottom-up tactics, approaches, in comprehending and experiencing the city over functionalistic top-down strategies of traditional urban planning. Be it Bill Drummond, to some of you still known as the frontman of the KLF, actually a band that made quite some noise in the 80s and 90s, with a very simple project called Man Making Beds. So what he has devoted himself for the last couple of years is just making beds. I think this was number 12, and he aims to do 40. So over three day, days, he built a bed, and at the end, sold it in a lottery. Or um, Leonard von Munster, which was kind of a take on J.G. Ballard's Concrete Island and the Tower, created in the public park of Rotterdam this sculpture um, of a brutalist building with this little green oasis on it or the Michael Johansson on the very right, who collected used furniture and kind of filled the gap between two museums on the Witte de Witt Street in a work called Tetris. Or the Far West Hotel by the French architecture collective Exist. What they did, they chose basically um, in the main city park designed by OMA, the little, there's a little pond and a little island, more of a symbolic island, where maybe the most some ducks kind of pass by every now and then. So they said, actually, we're going to build a bridge over there, and we're going to create a little hotel village. So in particular, with the work of Exist, the highly relational character becomes clear. It consciously activates the spectator through the artistic program, and thereby transforms architecture and space into a moving dialogue. The artwork here creates a social environment in which people come together to participate in a shared activity. The common denominator in these practice, practices is found in the link with the relational sphere. In a way, it's a one-to-one -one translation of the other sculpture that we saw from Leonard von Munster, the little tent against the brutalist building. French art critic Nicolas Bourriot, who coined the term relational aesthetics, claims the role of artworks is no longer to form imaginary and utopian realities, but to actually be ways of living and models of action within the existing real, whatever scale chosen by the artist. The artist can then be more accurately viewed as the catalyst in art, rather than being at the center and the audience as a community. A subject I further en engaged with in an exhibition and accompanying book entitled Testify, the Consequences of Architecture, which are perceived for the Netherlands Architecture Institute, which literally brings the people back into the picture and actually gives them a voice allowing the people who live in and in use buildings, who live the consequences of architecture on a daily basis, to contribute to a conversation that should have been happening all along. What does that mean? It means that the project I selected, I did not only get the information from the architects, that sounds always quite convincing, but I actually interviewed all the people who, who live these architecture on a daily basis. When it's a school in South Africa, we talk to the secretary, or when it's a project in Thailand, we talk to the trainee. And the, the beautiful uh, part of this project is that it clashed enormously between what the architects said and what the lived reality of these buildings actually said. That's the sole provenance of the architect and to attempt to interweave architecture discourse into the very fabric of society. Despite their manifold practical and conceptual differences, these projects are all united in an overall attentiveness towards the complex relationships between context and spatial intervention and a thorough understanding of the transformational, transformational power of architecture over time. Just click through here, it's too many to go in detail. They address the numerous current adaptive systems of social, political, ecological, and economic challenges and responsibilities that we are facing today. And they create a new picture of architectural thinking that considers its own consequences and that takes our built environment across urban as well as rural landscapes 
as an example of how to make a problem into a concrete possibility, not only for a solution, but an opportunity to highlight the complex set of factors from which the situation has risen. Or what I really like is a term by Stuart Brand, the founder of the whole Earth Catalog. He calls it a failure by failure approach to perfection. And this is the way to go. We're gonna fail all the time. We're gonna make mistakes all the time. The tricky part is whether we learn from them or not. So what you see a little bit in the projects that they range from actually build projects to completely ephemeral projects, from a skateboarding school to the project actually here in Rio, or political projects in, in Bogota. So this discussion, we also continue at the AIDIS network campus in Berlin, the Metropolitan Laboratory, which was established as a physical and intellectual space focused on the inseparable interplay between the urban form and social life. It was founded uh, in 2009 in Berlin, and as a member of the advisory board and a frequent lecturer there, we basically discuss subjects as design and politics, art and architecture, in close collaboration with major international universities and architecture foundations and practices. So three quarters of the way, mm, a quick reminder again, performative urban, performative urbanism, performing a city. So once again, the social, in the social lies the intrinsic quality of the performative element of architecture in the city. The performative constitutes situations which generate new social realities. So we see Josef Beuys here now in the back. So from a curatorial perspec uh, perspective, I'm explicitly inspired by the idea of the social sculpture. The concept by Josef Beuys, an extended concept of art that strives to structure and shape society and the environment through human activity. On an urban scale, this is reflected in a site and context sensitive approach towards addressing public sphere as a performative tool for social interaction and cultural communication. But actually, this is nothing really new. We have to be aware that our cities are, historically speaking, basically performative social sculptures. They are built upon ritual, performative, and festive experiences and sequences. Already in the third of his famous 10 books, Vitruvius, objected to the close spacing of columns on Roman temples, arguing that when the people come up by the steps to give thanks, they actually they cannot approach between the columns arm in arm, but in a single file. Nah, so, so this doesn't work. So this brief passage reinforces the close interaction between ancient buildings and ritual processions. And in his brilliant book, The Idea of a Town, by Joseph Reichwald, first published in 1963, he critiques those professionals who had reduced the city to abstractions by adopting strictly functional criteria by showing how rituals, myths, and festive celebrations literally shape the form of the urban environment. The shape of the city, its outer walls and gates and its public spaces and buildings were built taking into consideration a series of rituals and cer ceremonies. So, this history of festival architecture is not only restricted to religious constructions, it also includes architectural works commissioned by rulers to celebrate and proclaim their reign. Yet a coherent history of the temporary, ephemeral, and festival architectures emerges only in the early Renaissance. And all the major architects had their experience in staging festival accords or in cities for emperors, popes, and princes across Europe. At that time, such structures became a distinct genre, an art form to be cultivated throughout Europe. This genre reached its perfection in the Baron, uh, Baroque when political conditions were most favorable. What stands out about these architectures to me is their public aspect and their power to generate spatial imagination in the urban realm. Throughout history, they were all too often used as political tools Um, in the service of ruling elites, but also against them. The later, we are increasingly witnessing an, in in an interesting recurrence of the ephemeral within the urban discourse, namely the epochal unfolding of a worldwide wave of political movements that temporarily occupy existing urban spaces. 
think of Sao Paulo just a year ago. So this is an urban protest movement is both global and local at the same time. So the city here truly emerges, as there was the slide before, sociologist Saskia Sassen says, as a strategic site for understanding some of the major new trends reconfiguring the social order. The city and the metropolitan region, she continues, are one of the locations where major macro and global trends, even when not urban, materialize. It is then a space that can give us knowledge about developments that are not urban per se. She further argues in the theoretical foreline of Lefebvre's sense of the production of space that the street is a space where new forms um, of the social and the political can be made rather than a space for simply enacting ritualized routines. So this notion has been the topical inspiration for my second turn as a curator of the Vidya David Festival in Rotterdam in 2012. Under the title, The Street, Life Issue, my curatorial emphasis rested on the notion of the street and aimed to highlight the role and position of the street in contemporary political discourse through creative participatory processes. This thereby, it thereby not only considered the street as a space of encounter, and as an alternative site of artistic creation and cultural production, but foremost conceived the street as a highly social and political space, bringing in quotes actually through, from, from throughout history about the city, about urban space, about the street. So it, it followed like an approach that goes for all of my work, which I call edutainment. So it's somewhere between entertainment and education. Um, for this one, I invited not like the one before, 20 different artists, but I invited actually only two collectives, one of them being Raumlabor. And what we did for this one, we closed the main street off for the course of three days, got rid of all the cars, and we created a limousine service, creating these kind of cars that were built in the weeks before that now parked all over that street and that could be used as, as social sculptures. So the festival addressed the street as an integral element of social cultural interaction within the urban environment that is shared between all sorts of people. Rather than to understand the street um, as a monofunctional uh, place, or uh, to understand the street from a monofunctional perspective, the festival reimagined the street as an ever-changing altered state within the fabric of the city. Here was the Papa Mobile as well, um, that was used actually then over the course of three days as uh, the, the tool for the so-called street talks, talks inspired by, 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 the, um, by the Hyde Park, by the speaker's corner. So I invited quite an illustrious group of, of, of speakers, practitioners, and theorists who went up on the Papa Mobile um, and, and gave a spontaneous talk uh, on various subjects dealing with the city, the street, uh, the street as a political space, an artistic space, a space of of mobility, etc., and always creating spontaneous mobs. So it was a, a situation that none of them ever experienced before. Like there was no audience like you are, but it was just on the street and they were talking. Um, so focusing on the performative and participatory processes, a lot of workshops we did as well, more with architecture students as well with kids happening through these three days. Some of the or most of the, the, these, these social sculptures cars were used or could be used in many different ways. Um, so focusing on the performative and participatory, pro participatory processes in the urban context is a great tool, but it suggests by no means that successful city planning should be based solely on participatory design processes. Perish the thought immediately, as anyone would subscribe willingly who has partaken in seemingly open but all too often tenacious decision-making processes of this kind. What it reminds us of here, however, is not only that all space is social, and that it involves assigning more or less appropriated places to social relations, but also that urban planning, which rejects the human beings living in the city, in all their inherent complexity, beauty, and chaos, would never succeed, because it would fundamentally reject the city in its very being. So every city strives from this diversity. It needs consensus as much as it needs conflict as its enabling forces. This interaction of different levels may be symbiotic or may be conflictual, 
but exactly this multiple constitution is essential for the ultimate survival of the city. Today, urban planners, architects, and other creators alike therefore do not need to think and act in oppositional terms when engaging with the design of the city, but can learn from one another critically and wholeheartedly. The very concepts of public space, democracy, and citizenship are ultimately redefined by us, by the people, through lived experience. Some will succeed, others fail in the process, but in the end, it is the people who apply meaning to public space, whatever and wherever it may be. Or, in the famous words of the ingenious Cedric Price, a building is not always the best solution to a spatial problem. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>